in this presentation, there's a uh, there's a bit of archaeology to get through first, just to contextualise Rich Ruin, bring everyone how much speed on the site. So going through it, Rich is a site which is um, on the coast of Kent, or what was the coast of Kent during the Roman period, at one end of the Wantsom Channel. Um, Reculva, another Roman site um, contemporaneous with parts uh, parts of Rich River is a is positioned at the other end. As you can see on the map, I've labelled all of the supposed um, shore forts, although identification still up for grabs on some of them, really. Um, the project itself is working on the military equipment and tools, which I know has a, a broad um, is a broad brush, but for me, this is the worn military equipment, the weapons, anything that aids the military in their objectives, and the tools are put in there as well. It's basically English heritage picked what I was looking at, I've gone a bit beyond. So there's about 1,800 objects of what we've now catalogued as 8,000 small finds. Um, as an untold amount of pottery and all sorts of other things. And which was one of those sites which goes throughout the entire what we call the traditional Roman period. So it's often a source associated with the Roman invasion in AD 43 and as possibly the last jumping off point for the field army um, in the early 5th century. And these are what I like to call my two playrooms at Dover Castle with the archive and all of the small finds. And that room is one big room just full of Richborough. Um, so part of this you'll see Richborough as you've never seen it before. So how we look at it is through these five um, excavation volumes and this map which is in the fourth one which has got well 300 odd years of features all on one plan and part of the problems with these volumes apart from that they're inaccurate compared to what's in the archive is the baggage that comes along with talking about Richborough um, as a site let alone on a frontier which is 1920s 30s archaeology talks about Saxon raids and funnily enough the First World War had just ended and we we're fending off um, people from that region anyway. So it comes along with that that as well. So this is what I've been working on partially is, is remapping it. So this is the excavation areas. Um, if you look through many excavations, old excavations, a lot of people are doing this, trying to work out where they were going and what parts of the site um, are talked about in the archive. But as you can see, apart from a few trenches put across the long ditches, all the archaeology was done within the walls of the Fourth century, uh, third to fourth century shore fort. So everything outside, especially where there's been geophys around around the um, west side, needs uh, needs looking at. So going, Richborough is a traditionally a site of you know, Claudian invasion, military supply base, then a port town of the second century, then a bit of a gap in the early third, then the shore fort. I've now split this down into what I can see as these seventeen or so periods, and I've had to quickly change these a bit, as you can see the top one's got a bit mixed up this morning because of some coins that I discovered that weren't in the publications which changes the interpretation. So I'll go through these very very quickly. Mid to late 3rd century you get this fort lip built. It respects an earlier building um, in the west corner but also takes out, uh, took out a building that was in the um, north, uh, so in the northeast corner and surrounds an earlier monument which was built in the Domitianic period um, and is now this was turned into the, probably the Praetorium. Then you get the very, very late third and into the fourth century, you get the walls of the shore fort built. Um, and I've planned on the east wall, which, if you know Richborough, disappeared over the cliff edge. Um, and now, going along the, uh, there are only Trekkies in the room. Um, <laughs> if you want to ask me about this afterwards, uh, we figured the east wall out. <laughs> Um, but I won't go into that now because it's for another, another talk. Uh, going on into period 12, you see a cemetery appear. This is uh, early to mid 4th century. Um, not much going on in the fort apart from a few new buildings, possibly that bathhouse in the north uh, west corner. Period 13 pretty much looks the same. There's probably a, a continued use or a slight disuse of the site until we get to the mid 4th century where you get Brown's supposed church in the northeast corner. A baptismal font and these hashed areas pebble patches which funnily enough have gaps in them the nice size for barrack buildings so we know a lot more about the occupation later on then period 15 it's pretty much the same and this is going into the fifth century um, up until whether there was or not a saxon raid 
presented with the baggage of the uh, five volumes. So that's that out of the way. What I want to go on to is looking at the, the perspectives I'm taking on this. So one is following on from my supervisor, Ellen Swift, who looked at recycling um, in the Roman period and doing, the, um, doing some XRF analysis, find two different patterns in the fourth century fittings. First off, you've got a wide range of materials here. I've got to say this is surface XRF. It is, as far as I can tell, underestimating tin and zinc and overestimating copper and lead, and that's for various scientific reasons within the alloy. So these are belt fittings, late third, early fourth, uh, into, the, into the early fifth century. Then you look at these things called strap ends, which are the um, part of the Roman belt. And from there, as you get to the middle of the fourth century, they're all bronze and gunmetal. There's maybe some going up into the brass gunmetal range, but they fall away. And what it's looking like is you've got a lot of recycling going on. You've got these people who are possibly cut off from their supply. So we're on, if we want to call this area a frontier, we're on a frontier that is on its own. Even though you've got um, the Roman world just over 21 miles over the channel, you've got people living <coughs> and cut off from, from that main supply that they've been getting probably a bit before this. Just a bit more on the science side, anything fitting into these gaps, so this is the, the belt fittings, they fall all over the place. But there's less of the um, highly leaded objects uh, compared to strap -ins. You can see the, it completely shifts. The later objects are all these leaded bronzes, which are typical of late Roman Britain. Um, so this was quite interesting being rich for because this has been looked at across Britain and theorised that yeah, they're recycling and um, there's a lack of supply, but we're just on the coast. We're right by the continent and not getting the supply of good metals to make anything. So they're very much looking like it's a frontier cut off from that um, main Roman world. And there's different ways that we've been looking at recycling and how you theorise about these objects as well. So we've been looking at primary and secondary uses of objects as well. So one of these is objects made new. So we have these horse girth buckles, which as you can see from the pattern here, were made from, from late bracelets. So even though these objects might have had, as bracelets, had some... Um, identity attached to them, they probably had some designs that were particular to a certain region, these ones in particular Britain, they've been changed. They had no, none of that value to the person who picked them up and made them into a new functional object for themselves. We get the same with um, knives made from shears as well. And you start to think about these were used for different different purposes the shears maybe for cutting hair maybe for cutting fabric sheep shearing etc um but people have come along and found the broken ones or even the people who own them and just tried to make something new out of them so any cultural association with the shearing has gone this one in particular i haven't got the pictures of them yet but i can't get um two fingers through that through that um loop but what i can do is hold it in upon my hand and shave with it so we've gone from something that was used for well, essentially shearing sheep to shearing a person. Then we get cultural and even out of their time mixings as well. So on the well, on my uh, left we have a first century helmet fitting that was found in a fourth century context which looked to be welded to a fourth century helmet. So we've got something that's completely out of its time and it's been given a new identity based on the person who wanted to actually um, use this. The helmet is made from two different forms, one early 4th century and the other comes later in, later in the 4th as well. So we've got cultural mixings of things but also this, this level of poverty that we're seeing there as well. And then we also don't know much about these strap ends and what their cultural associations are and the iconography on them etc. But what we do know is these ones up here, these nail cleaner types, have got this bifid tip, are very, very British. Um, but they're taking something where their objects, these strappings, seem to come from um, the Danubian region that they made through and up through, um, through Europe. And this amphora type, which is very, very colonial style, the, the type is, this one in particular is a recycled one, 
has been not yet to arrive here too. So somebody's probably come along and added this, seen this and added it. And whether you go along with this as a um, stylistic thing, it's a cultural mixing, or if it's somebody seeing it and going, I need a nail cleaner and making their amphora one into a nail cleaner type, it's, it's very unclear. So what we're looking at is really truthfully looking at some of the other objects there. We're looking at various different, uh, a huge cultural mixing. We're looking at people, they've got the second legion probably moved to Richborough at some point in the late 4th century. We've got um, people who are likely to be Pannonians coming over. Um, we've got people from the Germanic Limes all living in one place at the same time. It's looking a bit, um, a bit of a mix. And this comes from looking at the Lankhill Cemetery, um, which is just uh, outside Winchester and very close to the uh, shoreport of Portchester. The pictures, the photographs are from Richborough. The drawings here are from the Lankhill Cemetery, Clark's excavations in the 70s. And there's similarities in the types of, of fissings around here. So you've got the belt buckles. Then you have, if it wants to go on to the next slide, more of the belt buckles, these biting beast or um, uh, zoomorphic types as well. And there's meant to be another one in there as well. Um, but what we see is we see these at Lank Hills, we see these at Richborough, which are really far apart. A few at Portchester, but none of the other shoreforts. So if we're looking at what has been looked at as one frontier built, or one set of forts built in the uh, third century, becomes completely disarticulated into the fourth. Because the Reculva, which is, let's say, 8.2 miles as the crow flies, has none of this. It doesn't have any of this material that looks like it's come from the continent, or at least been recycled into objects that have got a continental um, association. What we do find is we've got these things in Canterbury as well. So there's a possibility that we've got these troops who are out at Richborough as detachments of Canterbury, maybe moving around the forts, but they're not going to Reculver. They seem to be based in one place. The flip side of that is the other shore forts aren't as well excavated as Richborough, so we might not have looked in the right corner yet. But still, it's looking like there isn't really um, much, uh, much similarity. Then we have possibly a lot of Christian stuff going on. Um, so we're looking at identities coming in, you know, religious identities, I mean, some of the objects, whether they're very obvious, like the Cairo symbols or the font at the bottom. Um, the uh, sea creature on the strap end, which is associated with the story of Jonah and the whale, or somebody scratching an upside down Cairo on a pot. So different levels of, of um, expression there. I also want to focus on those pebble patches I mentioned about, which are uh, in the top corner and in the bottom corner there as well. They've got very nice gaps between them that look the right shape. And if I put the house stitch barracks on there, they fit very nicely, especially the cavalry runs up the top. The latest layer there, the destruction layer of that, apart from the possible dark earth that got ripped off the top, has Theodosian coins in. That layer then has a pit dug through it, or well even, which has Theodosian coins in the top, so it has to be going into the 5th century. And for a gap that's shaped like a barrack, there are no military finds there whatsoever. I have hairpins, spoons, spindle whorls, domestic stuff, but where the military goes, a cow frock, which could have come from any point, and a tiny bit of a helmet fragment. So we're looking like, what I've been looking at is that central list of objects and a few other bits and pieces. But it's looking very domestic up there, um, rather than a continuation of military occupation. So it's possibly the latest use of that building, even if it ever was used as a military building, is not that. So that led me on to James Gerard's look at the occupation or continued occupation of buildings in late Roman Britain into the fifth century. And that uh, if the field army did leave in the early 5th century, which was continuously being occupied at that point. So we've got a reuse, we've got a civilian use of what was essentially a frontier um, or a military frontier. It completely changes at that point. And then trying to think of where we could see similarities. And actually, the recycling links back to our whole make do amend attitude. They're not getting this. And as far as the home front analogy can go, it's this cut off from supply, cut off from the continent, but they are also supplying the continent. Britain is supplying the continent at the point, especially Kent, 
Um, a colleague of mine has written about the so the apparently absentee landlords, the villa owners who own land and possibly run land in Kent, are supplying the continent with um, with grain, with meat, with anything like that. And some of the short faults have been interpreted as this, finding evidence for butchery, but no evidence for the meat-bearing bones, which could be sent abroad. Um, so, really, what we're seeing in the late period is this is this cut-off, is also dispersed populations, when the army get there, are particular units being sent to different places, and we've got potentially Pannonians at Lank Hills and Winchester, and possibly Portchester, and at Richborough, but locally within their um the sites with the in the local sites and the shore forts are close to each other there's no there's no link so it looks like unlike any population in the region and there's this cultural mixing continuations of the fifth century is probably demonstrated through some of the later context the one problem is is that rich for what they did is they ripped out the top three feet um which pretty much destroyed any later in some medieval period occupation um, but what we do have is an emerging um, group of objects of medieval finds, potentially a lot of beads as well that might have been mis mis uh, misinterpreted as Roman being Saxon. So we're looking at that use later on. But the question, real question is, is rich for them and are the shore forts a frontier? Because if I go back to those early, those periods I've um, identified, you've got the Claudian invasion. Well, that would have been a frontier going into Britain at the very earliest period, that would have been that invasion frontier, which goes after a few years. Then you've got the port town, which really doesn't represent that. Then you've got the Gallic Empire usurping Britain. Does that make that their frontier? Then you have Carasius, who does it straight after that, and is potentially the one who builds some of the shore forts. The dating is a bit trickier here. But again, is that the usurper's frontier cut off from the empire? And then this complete cut-off and this supply in the empire and cut-off from supply, does that then make a front, uh, frontier against the supposed piracy in the uh, in the English Channel? So it shifts. Um, and is it a continuous one at the same time? So built maybe as a system, but then later on it's completely disarticulated. No two forts really relate, and they're regional rather than a system working together. Um, there's a lot more to it, and if you want to know any more about the redating of the site, it's it's interesting what they left out of the uh, public reports compared to the archive. So that's a um, that's a story for another time, though. Thanks. <laughs>